Well, good morning. I think I'm on, right? On. Yep. All right. Good deal. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, so uh, grateful to be with you this morning. What what a beautiful sight. I, I got to be honest. I, I'm uh, I'm tired. We got back. We went on a brief trip, and we got back about 10 o'clock last night. Uh, so kind of struggling this morning, but just a beautiful sight just to see the people of God gathered together. It's uh, especially in light of recent events of the last year, year and a half. Uh, what, a, what a glorious sight to see the people of God gathered together, opening the Word of God um, and having an opportunity to hear what He has to say to us. It's a glorious thing that we should never take for granted. What a, a beautiful thing. If you're watching online this morning, uh, we're thankful that you also have chosen to, uh, to listen in. Just a, a few uh, words there before we jump into the sermon text that Mark just read. Um, one, kudos to the, uh, the small group on the car wash. And I know some others that weren't in the small group helped with the car wash. Uh, what a wonderful expression of neighbor love. Um, this is the, the scriptures teach uh, in a, many places Love your neighbor as yourself, and quite literally, uh, the school is our neighbor. And so what a wonderful way to uh, demonstrate that love in a tangible way. I also want to say uh, how much I appreciate uh, Brother Caleb preaching last week, uh, filling in. Uh, I was finishing up my counseling training that I've been doing, and uh, Brother, your message was spot on, much appreciated. Um, it's been a thought of mine for quite a while that... Um, we are too worldly, and I, I'm, I'm thankful that you brought that message from Genesis. Um, we're going to be let down if we crave the world's approval. That's not why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and just a word there, it's been good to hear from Mark and Caleb over the last uh, few months. Um, I just want to say that that's, that's a really good thing. Um, it's, it's good for me because I, I get a breather every now and then, which is a good thing. I know some of you maybe wonder what in the world, you know, all you do is stand up there and preach and that's it. <laughs> it's good to get a breather every now and then. Uh, it's good for these brothers too, it really is. It gives them an opportunity to come and bring God's word and, and uh, they're, they're thankful, I know they are, they're using their gifts and they're developing them. Where is Mark anyway? Hey, you tricked me, man. I, I see you over here a lot of times, now you're over there today. All right. Uh, the, the other thing is, it's good for the church. Why is it good for the church? Well, it avoids placing too much emphasis on one person. Okay, this is not the church of Kevin Crouch. This, 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 this church is about, should be about, is always about Jesus Christ and Him alone. And so because of that, it's a good thing uh, for us to hear other brothers bring God's Word. And it allows us to invest in these brothers by giving them opportunities and uh, giving them opportunities to serve and to use their gifts. So, Brother, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for your assistance here over uh, the, the, the last few months, and we'll certainly you'll hear from them again. Um, we are concluding our prayer challenge uh, for May this coming week. It's crazy. That's already coming to an end. Um, hard to believe we're already almost five months through the year. I, I, I don't know where it goes. It's here. It's gone. That's how time is. Uh, but nevertheless, there it is. So let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll have our 60 seconds of silent prayer. Seek the Lord together, and then I will close us in that, and we'll jump into the text for the day. So let's pray together.
Our gracious Father, we are so thankful to be gathered today, to be able to freely open your word and to hear what it is that you have to say to us. And as we encounter this text today, we see a, a challenging text, but a glorious one because if we see what's there, we see how it points beyond Isaac and uh, this ram to Jesus, the Lamb of God that we sang about over the last few moments. So God, would you focus our hearts and our minds now? And by your Spirit, would you move among us and do the work that you have here today for your glory, for the building up of the body of Christ, and for the good, we, we pray, of those who don't know Christ. As they hear today, pray that you'd move in their hearts. By your kindness, draw them to repentance and faith in that very same Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. We pray this in His name. Amen. Well, if you're a student, it's that time of year. It is uh, almost graduation or around graduation time, but it's also the time for final exams. I think that's the one thing that everyone dreads about the end of a, a school year or a, a semester because it is the one hurdle that stands between you and the other side of either a summer break or graduation and the, the freedom that comes with that. I don't think I've ever met someone who said, you know what I can't wait for? Final exams. I'm, I'm looking for it. If you meet someone like that, uh, they probably have some issues. I remember the, the, the last, if you want to call it, final exam that I ever took. After uh, years of laboring in the process of uh, getting my Ph.D., six for me, uh, six years in total at that point, uh, it all came down to that. Your, your committee, in my case, three professors, uh, they've read your dissertation, uh, which is essentially you have to write a book, and now they're going to grill you about it. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, you pass it and you graduate. If you fail, they, if they're gracious, they can give you one more chance. If they're not feeling so gracious, then basically they, they terminate you from the program and they'll, uh, for all your labors, they'll give you a lesser degree. I, I did read this. I confirmed it in my handbook. At least that was our setup. And, and trust me, that would be a major letdown, not just for me, for the effort there, but also for my family who kind of went through that journey with me. So in the moments before that defense began, I was visibly anxious, as I'm sure most sane people would be. And I remember one of the professors that was involved in the whole process, he said something to me like, don't be nervous. Right, <laughs> right, right. I think I said something like, well, wouldn't you be? I mean, if you were me, wouldn't you be nervous? I, I, I tried to maintain my composure, but I don't, I mean, I guess I'm not spiritual enough. I don't know. It was, it was pretty challenging. Well, in today's passage, we see a, a final exam of sorts for Abraham. This is not like the test that we took in school. This is a test of faith. Does Abraham fear God or not? That's really the substance of the exam. Now, at times in the sermon series that we've been going through, following the Lord into the unknown, we've seen Abraham model great faith. And the author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11 brings those instances out. But at other times, we've observed tremendous failures on his part, uh, significant ones, uh, some of them involving his wife, some with his nephew Lot, uh, and so on and so forth. Failures that would rightly call his faith into question. And so this test will, will expose once and for all what truly is going on there in Abraham's mind and his heart. And the stakes are infinitely higher than they would be for any school exam. I, I don't care what degree you're going for. Uh, what was at stake for me seven years ago, What the story I just related, seven years ago the, what was at stake was a degree. 
But here, Abraham is dealing with the life of his son. This is no trivial matter. And not just any son, this is the son of the promise. In other words, this is the son, Isaac, whose birth was foretold ahead of time. He was truly a miracle as his mother was beyond childbearing years when he was born. Everything is riding, all the promises of God that we sang about today, they're all riding on that son, Isaac. Everything is kind of pointing towards him. He's the one who's supposed to inherit those covenant promises. And through him, Abraham's offspring will become a great nation and they will receive the promised land. And so from that perspective, this test makes no sense. Why would God tell Abraham to kill Isaac, right? Why, why would he do that? Is that even consistent with the character of God to instruct someone to perform a child sacrifice? I mean, these are questions that come up as you read this, this text. What in the world is going on here? Those are the things that come to mind. Well, we're going to look at those types of questions as we look at this passage today. And we're going to see how this story is very much what theologians would call a type. A historical reality that points to something greater. And here, that thing that's greater, that future spiritual reality, is the gospel. And so we're going to see that all over this text. There are some secondary lessons that I want us to look at today, and I'll go through those before we wrap up. Uh, this is a very rich text, and so I, I was anticipating, eagerly anticipating, getting to this text in our series. And I pray it'll be beneficial. So let, let's dive in, and let's look at the primary unavoidable lesson here this morning. Uh, again, when we get to the secondary lessons, I want you to understand this is the primary thing that we want to take away from the text. God's testing of Abraham points us to the sacrifice of his, capital his, that's God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this testing is a, a portrait, if you will, or a picture, a type of the gospel. Now, before we get too far into this passage, I, I want to remind you that we've covered portions of this text on multiple occasions over the last six months or so. So you're saying, what is this, reruns or something? No, it's not reruns. Uh, we, we looked at different angles here. And so back in December, we considered the latter part of the text because we talked about how Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. So later in the text, uh, in the, the verse there, 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. We've already covered that. We've already gone there back in December as a part of the Christmas uh, series. And so uh, we considered how the Apostle Paul went to Galatians, uh, in Galatians 3, uh, how the Apostle Paul talked about how that was a singular seed and how that pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we went through all that. And so because we examined that portion of the text on a previous occasion, we're not going to spend much time really in that part today because we've already gone there. And then on Easter Sunday, which was April 4th, again, crazy how fat Easter was like, what, a month and a half ago now, I preached from Hebrews 11 on Abraham and the resurrection. And so the author of Hebrews points us back to this text and said, this points us to the resurrection. Abraham trusted that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead, and that's part of the reason why he was willing to obey. And so again, we've already looked at Hebrews 11. I will reference that today. But we're not going to spend a lot of time there because we've already covered it. And so you, you may be saying in your head, well, then why are we going back to this for a third time? Well, the reality is, if you understood how rich and how much depth there is in this text, even covering it three times or different aspects of it three times, you still can't exhaust the depths of this. There's a lot that had to go on the cutting room floor because there's so much in this passage. This is a glorious passage with a beautiful portrait of the gospel that is worth looking at again and again and again and again. Even this morning as I was getting ready, I was thinking about other angles and things to try to bring out in the sermon. So we'll, we'll do what we can here. So let's walk through the passage together there in chapter 22. And as we're doing this, I, I want you to use your sanctified imagination a little bit. What do you, you want me to read something into the text? No, I just want you to put yourself in the text. Just think about what it would be like be a part of this. I, I imagine what it would be like to be Abraham or to be Isaac or even one of the servants that are coming along for the ride. My friends, allow yourself to be moved by this text. Uh, don't let it be just a, a dry old story to you. I assure you it is not. 
Honestly, this is another thing. It's not one of my sermon points, but it's something that I hope you get out of the, the sermon this morning is learning as we study our Bibles to immerse yourself in the passage, to think about it from those angles. It's okay to imagine what it would be like to be in this. I, I think one of the weaknesses sometimes in our Bible study, whether that's us reading the Scriptures individually or us in the church, is that we don't use our sanctified imagination. God just told you to kill your son. What? What? Think about what that would be like as we're, we're walking through this. Now, verse 1 informs us, after these things, it came about after these things, and so some time has passed between what came before. Well, what came before? Well, in the, the immediate passages before this, we see the sending away of Hagar and Ishmael, uh, Abraham's uh, older, his previous son with another woman. Uh, they were sent away, and so we saw that a couple weeks ago. And then we also saw Caleb brought us last week this, this covenant that Abraham made with Abimelech. And so after those, those things, some time passed. We don't know exactly how long. Moses doesn't tell us, but that's when these things happen after that. Now, I would assume that it's probably been about a decade or so since Ishmael was sent away based on the evidence that's there. And so Ishmael was sent away at a, after a, a feast that celebrated the weaning of Isaac. And so Isaac would have been a toddler probably at this point. And so that probably, I don't know, two, three, I don't know, one, whatever it was, that was when Ishmael was sent away. Now here Isaac is called a, a lad in the text. So apparently he's not an adult yet, but he is old enough to carry the wood of the sacrifice up a mountain. And so I'm guessing he's probably not like a five-year-old, right? Because I can imagine my, my five-year-old trying to carry a stack of wood up the mountain, probably not going to go so well. So uh, again, who knows exactly how old he is, maybe a preteen or, or an early teenager. Now, interestingly, some Jewish commentators historically have speculated that Isaac was 37 years old when this happened. They say, what? 37? Where did they get that number from? Follow me on this. They asserted that Sarah dropped dead when she heard what Abraham went to do with her son. And they did the math, because Sarah was 90 when she had Isaac, and she was 127 when she died. And so they did the math and said, that had to have been what killed Sarah. She heard, he did what? <laughs> he's, ta he's taking him to do what? And she dropped it. Now, I don't think that's right, okay? It doesn't go with the whole lad deal. I don't think that's accurate, but it's a very interesting theory there, uh, and it, it, it's mildly humorous. I, I, if, I was, if I heard that someone was going to do that, my spouse was going to do that with my son, I might drop dead too. Interesting theory. Now, as I said in the Easter message, and I'm coming back to this now in verse 1, verse 1 tells us that this is a test. Okay? It's a test. We have to get that. If we don't get that this is a test, you misunderstand the entire text. And people have distorted things about the character of God and other things because they're missing the fact that this is a test. That Moses is telling that so we understand God doesn't really want him in the grand scheme of things to sacrifice Isaac. He's testing Abraham. It's a test. It's a test. It's not a test for God's benefit when it says he's testing him to see what's in his heart. God already knows what's going on, right? God knows everything. You can't hide anything from the Lord. It is actually a test uh, that is for the benefit of both Abraham and all who would come after that because it would expose once and for all what was in Abraham's heart. Does he fear God or not? And this test will clearly show that if he fears God or not. What is the test? Well, God tells Abraham to offer up his son Isaac. Uh, verse 2, now take your son, your only son, whom you love. Now, he is, in one sense, he's not his only son because he has Ishmael, but Ishmael's been sent away. He's not with him anymore. So in that sense, he is his only son. And Isaac being the son of the promise. Take your son, uh, whom you love, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And so there is the test. Now the place where he's supposed to go, it's called Moriah. Well, what does that mean? Does that have any significance? Some have come to the conclusion that the sacrifice was supposed to take place 
on the Temple Mount based on a reference in 2 Chronicles. So 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1 says this, then Solomon, this is hundreds of years after the time of Abraham, then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David, at the place where, that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And so that reference there uh, is the, the same name. And so there's debate. You read commentaries on this. There's debate as to whether it was actually the Temple Mount or whether they just had the same name. I, I really don't know. I, I don't know what the, the final conclusion, a decent case could be made either way. But I do think it's not coincidental that the same name is used. So whether it's actually the same geographical place or not, I do think it's significant that the name is the same. And I'll talk about that more in just a bit. Now this test is, is shocking. right? It should be shocking. The, the original reader should have looked at this and said, uh, God tested Abraham. Well, that's interesting. What did he test him with? Kill your son and offer him as a burnt offering. What? It's supposed to be shocking. It's supposed to get our attention. Uh, if you, you could just, again, for a minute, place yourself in Abraham's shoes. You want me to do what? No. I, 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 what? J just put yourself in that situation for a moment. How can I kill my own son? I love him. God acknowledges that. He says, the son whom you love, how on earth... God, is the promise of descendants going to be fulfilled if the one that you promised this was going to happen through is gone? How could I do that? How could I kill my son? This doesn't make sense. And yet, amazingly, amazingly, Abraham obeys. He obeys. Look at verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And then he goes about making preparations to do exactly what God told him to do. He's not stalling. Put yourself in that position for a moment. If it's me, I'm probably going to stall or something. Uh, okay, you're thinking of ways to get out of this, and he's not doing that. Abraham gets up. He doesn't say, I'm going to kick the can down the road as far as I can. He gets up early the next morning, and he gets after it. He's going to obey. He's not stalling for time. So he readily obeys, just like he did when God told him to send Hagar and Ishmael away. Verse 4 tells us that on the third day, uh, they, they reach, or they see at least, the place of sacrifice. And so they see the location, and Abraham tells his servants, you guys stay put, you stay with the donkey and whatnot, I'm going to take him, we're going to go over there, and we're going to worship. And so verse 5 really appears to be what the author of Hebrews picked up on, uh, why he thinks that, or why he asserted that, rightly, that Abraham believed in resurrection because it says here, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Abraham knew exactly what he was going there to do. He didn't know it was a test, but he knew what God told him to do. And yet he still says, we're going to come back to you. And so that's why the author of Hebrews says he believes in the resurrection. Let's go to that reference again. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. And so Abraham is reasoning that if God can have my postmenopausal 90-year-old wife have a child, then he must be able to raise him from the dead, and so I should obey him. And so that's what he sets out to do there. Verse 6 through 8 uh, depict the two, the father and son, traveling on alone. Isaac carries the wood. Abraham carries the fire, or at least the instrument to make the fire. I don't know if they're using it for that or not, but there's something to start a fire there if it's not the actual fire himself. And, uh, and the knife. Now Isaac's not dumb. Okay, he's not dumb. Something's missing. 
He's looking around. He's like, okay, wait a minute now. I got the wood. You got the knife and the fire or the fire starter. Something kind of is missing from this picture. Where's the sacrifice? Right? The Lord will provide. The Lord's going to provide that. You wonder what's going through Isaac's head. Well, maybe dad knows something I don't know. I'm not sure. Verse 9, Abraham builds the altar. He arranges the wood. He binds Isaac and he places him on top of the wood. Now, as I've been stewing on this passage over the last couple of weeks, it occurred to me that this test did not just require obedience on Abraham's part. At this point, Abraham is... He was 100 when Isaac was born. Let's say he was 12, 13. He's, he's over 100 years old. He's maybe in his 100 teens or something. And he's got this young, strong lad who's carrying the wood up. And he's saying, hey, let me tie you up and put you on this wood so that I can kill you and offer you as a burnt offering. I'm pretty sure, now the text doesn't say this, but I'm reasonably certain even if Isaac couldn't overpower his dad, which he probably could have, I'm sure that he could have outrun him, okay? I'm sure Isaac could have just bailed and said, I'm out of here. (laughs) That's what you want to do? That's your idea for the the lamb, for the sacrifice? I'm out of here. And yet he obeyed as well. And actually, that's, again, considering what uh, Jewish commentators, the, the commentaries I consult, reference these, they've placed a great emphasis in the past on Isaac, which makes sense. Uh, I do think there's something to that because Isaac willingly submitted to this. Again, I I don't think that Abraham could have done that without Isaac's cooperation. I I guess could have hit him in the head or something, but I, I doubt that's what he did. So verse 10, the moment of truth. What's Abraham gonna do? Will he obey? Everything's led up to this point. Is he going to obey or is he not? And here we are. And so in an act of faith, Abraham grabs... I don't have a knife behind the pulpit, okay? That wouldn't be safe. we got kids running around here. Probably not a good thing. It's like bad pastor moment number 522. Put a knife behind the pulpit, okay? How about that price shouldn't be there either. Let's not pick that up. How about this, okay? He picks up the knife... And he raises it up to slay his son. And it's very clear that he's intending to actually take Isaac's life just as he's been commanded. And so then we get to verses 11 and 12 and the test concludes. The angel of the Lord calls to him and says, Abraham! Abraham! He says, here I am. He says, don't harm the boy! Now I want you to stop there for just a moment and put yourself in that place if you're Abraham. What's going on in your heart and your mind as that takes place? It's been almost a year now, almost a year, since I nearly lost my youngest son in one of the lakes at a state park here. Almost a year. Next, beginning of next month, it'll be a year. It still bothers me to think about it, how traumatic the experience was. Stupid dad, I shouldn't say that. Dumb dad moment. Is that better for parents? Dumb dad moment. He's on the dock. We're fishing. I'm thinking it's a dock. We're not out in the boat. I don't put a life vest on my son, but it's a deep lake. It's a floating dock. It was an old coal mine. And he's standing there on the dock, and I hear one of his brothers shout his name as he's going into the water. And I jump into the water, and I swing my arm to try to grab him, and I miss! And my heart just stopped. And I swung a second time, and by God's grace, I got his leg, and I pushed him up, and then his brother took him out of the water. To this day, I I mean, just after that point, the rest of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm in tears when I'm thinking about what took place. Now multiply that by like a billion, and you think about what happened with Abraham. He's standing there over his son with the knife in his hand, and the angel calls to him, Abraham! Abraham! Stop! Can you feel that? What it would be like? Your own son. The emotion just welling up within you. And you look over and you see the ram caught in the thicket by its horns. God has provided just as you said. And you embrace your son in tears. He's fearful. He's trembling. You embrace. And God's done what you said he would, and what you always knew he would, he provided. 
And so what does he do? He gets the ram. Bad news for the ram, of course. He gets the ram and he offers it as a sacrifice. And then the rest of the text talks about how uh, God reaffirms the promises. Again, we've covered that, so I don't want to spend too much time there. It goes back to chapter 12 and all the way through. God has promised these things and God affirms swearing by himself, adamantly saying, these are the promises and they will be fulfilled. And then he goes back, the whole crew comes back together with the servants and they go back to the place where they've been dwelling as sojourners, as Caleb said last week. You see, it's not right when we read our Bibles and we just kind of skim up. Abraham was tested. He was told to kill his son. No, no, no. A lot more there. God tests Abraham. Abraham passes the test. But if we zoom out and we look at the entirety of Scripture, we see that there's a lot more there because ultimately this passage, with all the emotion and everything that's wrapped up in this, it points us to the Gospel. To the Gospel. To the sacrifice of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's, let's think about this for just a moment. We've already looked at Hebrews 11, and so the author of Hebrews is clearly saying, he's making a connection between what happened with Abraham and Isaac and the resurrection. We've talked about that. But there's a lot more parallels here to the gospel. Some of you probably are already thinking of these. The early church fathers picked up on these things. Now, sometimes the pastor theologians in the early church were pretty far out there in some of their interpretations of Scripture. They... they, Saw things many times in allegorical terms, kind of, well, this thing points to that and this, and you're like, yeah, that's kind of a stretch. But a man named John Chrysostom, an early church preacher who was known for his faithful, literal exposition of of biblical texts, this is what he said about this passage. I quote, All this, however, happened as a type of the cross. Hence Christ, too, said to the Jews, Your father Abraham rejoiced in anticipation of seeing my day. He saw it and was delighted. He's quoting there from John 8, 56. Back to Chrysostom. How did he see it if he lived so long before? In type, in shadow. Just as in our text the sheep was offered in place of Isaac, so here the rational lamb with a capital L was offered for the world. You see, it was necessary that the truth be sketched out ahead of time in shadow. And so what is he seeing there in the text that points him to the gospel? Let's think about this. In both accounts, God is requiring a sacrifice. Right In the test, the sacrifice is Isaac, but the ultimate sacrifice is Jesus, whose sacrifice is necessary because of the sin of man, mankind. Because of our sin... There, someone must pay the price. And so, again, a sacrifice is necessary. It's required by God. Another parallel. The promised son is the one who will be sacrificed. So Isaac is the son of the promise in the, the life of Abraham. Jesus Christ, of course, is the Messiah, the son of God. And so, again, the promised son is the one who will be sacrificed. How about this detail? The one who is going to be sacrificed is carrying the wood that he's going to be sacrificed upon. And so Isaac is carrying the wood. Jesus carries his own cross to the point where he's exhausted because of the beating that he's taken, and they enlist the help of someone else. But again, Jesus at least partially carried the cross. How about the name Moriah that I mentioned earlier? It ties the sacrifice of Isaac to the Temple Mount, whether or not it was the exact same mountain. uh, In one sense, it's irrelevant. The Temple Mountain is where the Levitical priests later on would offer sacrifice. And those sacrifices were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And so there's a connection there, uh, even if it's not the exact same mountain. How about the submission of the Son? Right? Isaac, obviously, as I said earlier, he could have, ra- he could have run away. He did not do that. He willingly submitted to this. And Jesus Christ 
could have called down legions of angels as he told his disciples. Peter tries to cut off the guy's ears. Let's fight. Jesus said, come on. I could call down legions of angels if I desired. And Jesus willingly submitted to his own crucifixion, even though he could have stopped it. He didn't. How about the fact that the Father is the one who will offer up the Son? Now you say, well, wait a minute now. What does that mean as far as the gospel? Well, think about Isaiah 53.10, which clearly points us to Christ. It says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And so again, the wrath of the Father coming on the Son, not because Jesus was a sinner, of course he was not. He was the spotless, sinless Lamb of God. How about God providing the sacrifice? In both accounts, God is the one who provides the sacrifice. Abraham sees the ram caught in the thicket, coincidence just happened to be a ram hanging out there at the moment no god brought that about he provided the lord provided and of course the lord provided his son jesus and then we've got the type of the resurrection of course the author of hebrews uh he says the resurrection takes place it's on the third day now i think it may be a little bit of stretch but i do think the third detail third day detail that it took them three days to get to the mountain where the type of the resurrection occurred, there may be some connection there. But again, there's lots of details that point us from this to the gospel. I was talking to, to Caleb this week about this passage, and he brought up another parallel between the fathers here. Abraham demonstrates his faith through his willingness to offer his son. When God, the Father, actually does offer his son as a sacrifice, as a, 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 an atonement, for sinners, he's demonstrating his faithfulness, his covenant love. He's keeping his promises. And we're seeing that in the character of God. What a glorious God who would willingly give his only son. So in one sense, this text is about Abraham and Isaac. That, that actually literally did happen. But in another sense, this always was supposed to point beyond that to the giving of the son, Jesus Christ. We see the gospel in this text. Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, offered Himself as a sacrifice for sinners. God provided a way, the way, the only way, for us to be made right with Him through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus. Jesus lived uh, a sinless life in His earthly ministry. Of course, uh, well, you could go into all sorts of things there, but God, God provided Jesus. He came to earth. He took on flesh. He lived a sinless life. He willingly gave himself. God provided the sacrifice. Why? So that we would not have to pay for our own sin. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And then he was raised from the dead. My friend, this same Jesus lives today. Today. The resurrection is, is applicable, is relevant today because that same Jesus who was crucified, buried, raised, reconciling sinners to the Father today. Today. My friend, I urge you, I plea with you, if you're hearing the sound of my voice, whether you're here or the overflow or you're watching online, be reconciled to God. I plea with you, plead with you, just as the Apostle Paul did. If you're listening today and you're wrestling with this and you're saying, oh, I, I see the connections that are here, make the connection that there is hope for sinners today because of the sacrifice of the Son and come to Jesus in repentance and faith. I plead with you. I would love nothing more than to personally speak to you about the love of God that was demonstrated and the forgiveness that comes only through Jesus Christ. I would love to point you to the, 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 the Savior. And so, if you're listening and you're wrestling with this, please talk to me about this. Or grab another, uh, uh, another uh, church member here or something and talk to them about the Lord Jesus. Now, there are some secondary lessons I want us to consider. I know we spent a lot of time on that as we should have. 
There's two secondary lessons I want us to think about here. The second, or the first secondary lesson, first secondary lesson, odd, but hey, there you go. Secondary lesson number one, genuine faith produces obedience to the Lord. You say, where are you getting this from? Well, this is actually what James is trying to convey in the New Testament when he picks up on this lesson. He talks about Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac, James chapter 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Now wait a minute. Is James contradicting what the Apostle Paul says in in Ephesians chapter 2? Ephesians chapter 2, here's what Paul says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Is there some sort of contradiction there? No. No, actually there's not. They're making different points, kind of different angles of things here. Because if you zoom out a bit and you read the larger context of the passage in James, you're going to understand his overall point. So let's go to that. James chapter 2. The passage picks up in verse 14. What use is it, my brethren? If someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Here we go, here's the context. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. My friend, the point that James is trying to make here is that if the faith does not produce any works, the faith is dead. It's not real. It's not genuine. Real, genuine faith is transformative. It changes us from the inside out. That's that's why uh, he references this test here with Abraham and Isaac. The test of the sacrifice revealed the genuineness of Abraham's faith. It showed what was actually going on. It was a test. When you take a test, that test is is a gauge. It's an indicator. What's going on? Does he know the material? Does he not know the material? I guess you need to study again, young man. I'm sure some of you heard that before. Because why? You didn't actually know it. The test exposed it. And the test here exposed that Abraham genuinely feared God. He trusted him. And it revealed the genuineness of his faith. And so James's point is illustrated in Abraham. And it's true in our day as well. You ever heard of the term easy believism? You ever heard, anybody ever heard of that easy believism? Or you could put it the way that Dietrich Bonhoeffer did in his classic work, The Cost of Discipleship. He called it cheap grace. Now, that's, this has been a real problem in American evangelicalism for a very long time. Now, since it may be fading as our culture Uh, is less and less influenced by Christianity and the church, but it's still prevalent in the minds of many. Just pray this prayer, sign this card, walk this aisle, do your business with God, and you're good to go. That's it. That's all there is. Just you're good to go. In other words, check this spiritual box and you're in. That's the end of it. Now, I'm not knocking prayer as a genuine way to initiate or begin the Christian life. I'm not knocking that. Because we should call out to the Lord to save us. I'm not knocking that. But is that by itself biblical faith? Is that what James is conveying here? Or is James saying something more? 
What do we do with Abraham's test if all we need to do is just check a box? Right? I'm sure Abraham would have loved to check that box. I Forget about this. I don't want to sacrifice my son. It's more than checking a box. It changes us. It transforms us. True faith is not merely transactional. It's not like we're just pulling the salvation lever. That's not how genuine faith works. I'm not saying that people don't genuinely come to faith by calling out to the Lord, but what I am saying is that genuine faith affects the way we live. It produces obedience as we see in Abraham. That's what faith does. That's why Jesus can make the statement that he does in John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, conditional, if you love me, you will do what? You can read, I know you guys can. Yes! How can he make that connection? Because the test, if you will, of whether or not you love him is the fact that you're keeping his commandments. It's, it's the same thing as Abraham. It's pointing what's on the inside is coming out. It's actually changing us. You are, that's why Jesus says you must be born again. Different person, not the same. Now, I can already hear someone in their head. I can't hear what's in your head, okay? I'm not, that's not like that. I'm imagining, okay? Oh, so you're saying that if we're not perfectly obedient, then we're not saved. I'm not saying that. That, that, that's ridiculous. What I am saying, and what more importantly, what God is saying in His Word is this. If there is no life change whatsoever that occurs when a person uh, outwardly professes faith in Jesus Christ, then something is seriously wrong. Seriously wrong. Because without transformation... Without the good works that result from genuine faith, your faith is dead. That's what James says. Pointing back to the instance with Abraham. Now, incidentally, if you're making that objection in your mind, it's probably because, and you're not seeing the connection between faith and obedience, you probably have misunderstood the doctrine of what we call progressive sanctification. When you come to the Lord, generally, I would say in every case, honestly, there's a lot of things that need to be different, okay? And God is gracious. And those things don't all change immediately. But He sets us on a different trajectory. And He's at work within us. My friends, the point is this. I think we cheapen faith when we make it merely transactional. As if you have this one-time event. That's it. I did this. I did that. 30 years later. Well, what? You did what? Genuine faith produces obedience. My friends, progressive sanctification, we grow in the faith over time. If we think, if you've been in Christ for any period of time and you think back at stuff that maybe you said or did in your early Christian life, uh, hopefully you'll cringe a little bit. I would. Oh. I'm glad that I don't have a recording of my first sermon because I would not want to listen to that, I assure you. Or here's another potential objection someone could say. Well, Pastor Kevin, aren't you preaching salvation by works? No. No, we're not doing that. And neither is James. He's simply saying that if a person's faith is genuine, it does something. It does something. There is transformation taking place. No transformation, no faith. That's what James is saying there. So what about you? Let's not stop there and just have these theoreticals. Let's think about what about you? Now, all of us should be challenged by this thought, is our faith producing obedience to the Lord in increasing measure? But let me be more pointed for a moment. Are you resting solely in a card that you signed or a prayer you prayed or an aisle you walked many, many, many years ago with no real change of attitude or lifestyle from before when you checked that box? Don't rest in that. Would the Bible describe your faith as genuine or dead? I think we have to wrestle with these issues. Now, if you're wrestling with that, if you're thinking through this, I would encourage you to come talk to me about it. I can't see your heart, but I can pray with you and point you to places in God's Word that can help you. And one of those places would be the book of 1 John. 
If you're wrestling with the issue of your own salvation and assurance of it, I would encourage you, it does not take long to read, but what it says is directly applicable and it's pretty heavy hitting. Let's get to our last point, the second, le- the second secondary lesson. They told us in seminary, don't be overly complicated with your points. I don't know if this is overly complicated or not, but hopefully it gets the point across. God desires our all, and thus we cannot withhold from Him even those things that are most precious to us. Yes, this was just a test for Abraham. God did not, it, 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 Moses tells us that, so we see the character of God. He did not intend for him to actually sacrifice his son. It was always supposed to be a test. But Abraham didn't know that. It's not as if God spoke to him and said, Hey, psst, this is a, just a test. Let's see how you do. All right, well, I'm going to play along with your test. That's not what happened. From Abraham's perspective, God just told him to kill Isaac and offer him as a burnt offering. And Abraham obeyed. And this was after Abraham had already given so much to to follow the Lord into the unknown. Chapter 12, remember? Leave your land, leave your family, your people, and go to the place. I'm not going to tell you where it is right now. I'll show it to you. I want you to leave and I want you to go. And along the way, as he sojourns, He has much heartache. Remember when he had to send Ishmael away? And he agonized over it. Why? Because he's a dad and he loved his son. He didn't want to send him away. And apparently at this point he's not in contact with his beloved nephew Lot either. Do you see Abraham was blessed beyond measure, but his life was filled with sorrow and heartache at points. And yet he still followed the Lord. I don't think in our day and age we understand the concept of sacrifice, and I could spend a lot of time on that. But I I, I think it's more than we're just impatient. I I think we don't understand sometimes and appropriate the truth that's expressed throughout the pages of Scripture, perhaps most pointedly in 1 Corinthians 6. Say, well, you've taken us here before. Uh, Yeah, and I'll probably take you here again because it's a wonderful reminder of something that we need to hear. Paul writes this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are, finish it with me, not your own. Not your own. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Now in that context, he's speaking of sexual immorality. He's dealing with a specific situation in the Corinthian church. But the larger principle is that God rightly owns it all. Psalm 24, the first two verses. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. He created it all. He owns it all. If that's true for the world at large, it certainly is the case for believers. Let me put it another way. All of life is to be lived for God's glory. All of life. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul's speaking of meat sacrificed to idols. But he makes a larger point here when he says, whether then you eat or drink, talking about the sacrifices, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. My friends, if we could grasp that thought, it revolutionizes the way that we live. Because we're not trying to stick God in a box, compartmentalize and say, well, I have my churchy stuff and this is God's and when I'm in church, yeah, that's I'll act a certain way. And then when I'm over here, this is my time. This is my job. It's my this. It's my that. It's my, my family, my money, my this. And God says no. He says no. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So why do we try to withhold things from the Lord? God, I know you say this in your word, but I really just... No, you're gracious. You'll you'll forgive me. Let us not presume on the grace of God, but live 
as though we recognize that all of life is to be done to the glory of God. I've been in this counseling training the last few months, and the guy that leads the training, he describes it as a one-string banjo. It, I counted. I wasn't sure exactly. There's five on there, right? Is that right? Five. I never played a banjo before. Played a bass, not a banjo. Five. He talks about the one-string banjo. Glory of God, glory of God, glory of God, glory of God. That's every issue in counseling, every issue in life, it points back to that every single time. That's the central focus. How can I glorify God in my marriage? How can I glorify God with my finances? How can I glorify God with my service in the church? How can I glorify God in my interaction with unbelievers? How can I glorify God in this, in that, in this, in that, in this, in that? Genuine faith produces obedience. How can we glorify God? By being obedient to his word. And so if we will approach all of life from that perspective, it's totally transformative. It transforms everything. That is how God desires us as believers to live. Stop thinking in terms of just this or just this or just this and think globally in terms of my entire life does not belong to me. It is His. It's His. And so whatever I'm facing in life, it's all to be done to God's glory to the point where I would not even withhold my own son. Oh, The one thing that is most precious in this world to Abraham, God says, give him to me. He does it. Or he's about to. Oh, that we would live that way. God, would you make us a people whose every desire, whose heartbeat is consumed with the passion, with a passion of living for you. And not just out of duty or something of that nature, but out of love for you. Inflame our hearts with love, and Lord, we pray that it would affect every aspect of our lives, both as individuals and as a church. We recognize that this is not the way that we are wired in the fall. We're broken, Lord. We're sinners, and we rebel against you because we want to be on the throne. Oh, God, thank you that your mercies in Christ are great, and we thank you for the work of your Spirit who lives in us if we're in Christ. That we can be more and more conformed to the image of your Son, transformed, being renewed in our minds by your grace alone. Lord, please make Rikers Ridge Baptist Church a bright light to the nations because you're at work in your people here. And we pray that through this, that people would hear, understand, and respond to the glorious gospel of your son. Not that we might boast, but that we might boast in you alone. That you could take a bunch of broken, sinful wrecks and do a glorious work. We pray this in Christ's name.